Okay, so the rest of these slides will be about um, sort of individual antibiotics, but you'll see they come in groups. So it's not going to be like one slide per antibiotic. It's going to be stories to tie them together. So we're going to look mostly at antibiotics that disrupt the cell wall, and these are going to include the penicillins, so the original penicillin and all its derivatives, cephalosporins, which are similar, they work the same way, carbapenems and astreanam that all work the same way as penicillin does, as we will see, and then vancomycin, which works in a slightly different way. And so we're going to look at these antibiotics and how they compare to each other, and we're going to look at the resistance to them and how that all works. So this is all the um, antibiotics that work against the cell wall. So um, what we call the beta-lactam antibiotics, work. Um, they all work the same way, penicillin, cephalosporins, carbapenems, and monobactams. Um, we have a lot of penicillins, so just different derivatives of penicillin, and we have a huge number of cephalosporins, and they're not even all here. These are the most common antibiotics. So the most widely prescribed antibiotics are cephalosporins. So that's the thing. So to understand how they work, we need to understand how cells work. So we need to understand the target of these antibiotics. And they all have the same target, which is the what's known as the penicillin binding protein. It was discovered before we, it was discovered relative to penicillin before we understood what it did. So it has this stupid name, penicillin binding protein. I will refer to it as the transpeptidase, because the reaction it does is it connects two amino acids. So it does a transpeptidation reaction. Um, so before we get to that, let's think about what a cell has to do when it grows. Remember, um, a bacterial cell has a thin, weak, waterproof membrane surrounded by a tough, flexible, but not waterproof peptidoglycan layer. And the peptidoglycan layer is what limits the size of the cell, and that's important because if the cell um, starts to get high osmotic pressure, it can't afford to keep expanding. It will pop. So the, um, the cell wall prevents the cells from popping. So if the cell wants to get bigger, it has to make the peptidoglycan bigger. And the way it has to do that is to break bonds in peptidoglycan and add more peptidoglycan into the break. So it has to add new pieces of peptidoglycan and cross-link them together with the old ones. So imagine that this is an old peptidoglycan chain. Peptidoglycan has a carbohydrate backbone and then amino acid chains or peptide chains. Um, so we have this old chain with one, two, three visible amino acid chains, and then we have a new one that the cell wants to attach. Um, what it wants to do is form a bond between these two amino acids. And so this enzyme, the stupidly named penicillin binding protein that I will refer to as the transpeptidase, it does this reaction. So it will um, cause a uh, chemical bond between the two chains. And what it would do is it would do this one, and then it would do this one, and then it would do this one. And so this new peptidoglycan would become part of the overall peptidoglycan of the cell. If you're trying to envision this, I think the best way is to think about making bell-bottom pants. If you want your pants to be a huge at the ankle for some reason, what do you do? Well, you cut them and add a big piece of fabric and sew it in so that it becomes essentially part of the fabric. And that's what we see here. It's been sewn in. Well, that's what the cell has to do. If the cell wants to go from normal gene size to big bell bottom size, the cell has to cut the peptidoglycan and add new peptidoglycan and then 
um, bond them together to get something like this. Whenever somebody gives you an analogy, the best thing you can do is think about how that analogy is valid and how it isn't. When you're studying something with your study buddies, a good idea is to have everybody come up with a different analogy and compare them. Because what you'll see is that what the analogies will have in common is the essential um, component. So anyway, this is our analogy. And what happens if the cell is trying to grow and we add a um, what we call a beta-lactam antibiotic is the cell will try to do this transpeptidation reaction and make this bond. But if penicillin comes in, the penicillin will permanently bind to the transpeptidase enzyme so that it won't be able to keep going. And ultimately, whatever holes the cell makes in the peptidoglycan will get bigger and bigger. Um, and ultimately, this is what will happen. The penicillin will start screwing up... Um, Penicillin will start screwing up the cell wall, and eventually a big enough hole will form that the membrane comes out through it. And if there's any mechanical shock to this, it will just break and the cell is dead. So these are the penicillins. What they all have in common with each other is the molecule inside this box. Um, so it's drawn out here so you can see it, but then in all these other diagrams, it's just shrunk down to be a little box. And so what's going on in this box is a beta-lactam ring. And beta-lactam refers to the chemical structure. It doesn't really matter. I'm not going to make you draw this or any other antibiotic structure. But I, what I want you to understand is that this mimics, to some extent, um, peptidoglycan, so that the transpeptidase enzyme tries to do the reaction against this, and it reacts with the enzyme and permanently poisons it. So all penicillins work the same way. They all have this beta-lactam that will react with the transpeptidase enzyme. What's different about them is this part. If you look penicillin G versus penicillin V, um, this is, well, it's just a hydrocarbon, and then this is an ether, as an ether group. And as we'll see in the next slide, by changing from this to this, we go from an acid labile penicillin, which has to be injected because stomach acid would destroy it, to an acid uh, tolerant penicillin V, which can be taken orally. Um, more important than that, these only work against gram-positive bacteria. But if we change this part, if chemists change this part, um, it changes the way this molecule interacts with the cell membrane and with the peptidoglycan. And so it changes which cells um, will be sensitive to it. So for example, methicillin will work against a lot of bacteria that are resistant to penicillin. Or historically, it did. In a lot of cases, it still does. Ampicillin works against some gram-negative bacteria just because it differs. Instead of a hydrogen here, it has an amine group, and that makes it different enough that it'll work against some gram-negatives. Scientists couldn't predict which change would do what. We don't know why this would make a difference, but it does, and we found by experimentation these different structures that have become very useful antibiotics. So just to reiterate, penicillin G and V, um, that's what I was just talking about. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to say in this video is about um, resistance to penicillin and how we get around that. Um, remember, this is the beta-lactam nucleus with the beta-lactam ring. And there are enzymes called penicillinases that break this bond to make this. This will no longer react with the transpeptidase enzyme. This is just a random molecule that the cell doesn't care about anymore. So penicillinase breaks this bond and inactivates penicillin. And this is a version of a beta-lactamase.
so it breaks the beta-lactam ring. So there are a lot of different types of beta-lactam antibiotics, and there are different types of beta-lactamase enzymes that break them down. And what they all do is break this bond here. So what do we do about that? Well, it turns out we have molecules that act as inhibitors of beta-lactamase enzymes. So clavulanic acid is one. If you've ever heard of augmentin, the antibiotic augmentin, that's a mixture of penicillin with the penicillinase inhibitor, clavulanic acid. A different thing we can do is use newer beta-lactams. So um, some of the penicillins will work despite the presence of a penicillinase. Cephalosporins, as you'll see in the next few slides, will work against um, bacteria with penicillinases. The problem is that something like MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, it isn't just resistant to methicillin. It has a mutant transpeptidase that makes it resistant to most or probably all beta-lactam antibiotics. Another way uh, we fight against penicillinases is with the semi-synthetic penicillins. So some of the newer penicillins that have the different structures, again, um, can resist penicillinases. These are the semi-synthetic penicillins like ampicillin, um, methicillin, etc. And that is enough for this video.